Hello everybody, welcome back to Mega Projects. This one is another request from you guys pulled straight from the comments below. If you have suggestions, leave them in the comments below and I will get to them. I uh, I sent this to our writer for this channel, Ollie, and I said, Ollie, can you put together about the R23? It's a space cannon. It's gonna be awesome. And Ollie was like, Simon, I didn't find much information about that. What if I put together some information about that and also just touched on space weaponry? To which I replied, hell yes. And this is what we have. Let's get on with it. Space Cannon. Two words that are bound to excite the small space geek inside all of us, or in my case, massive space geek. I love all this stuff, and I love sci-fi. But it's never been done, right? Or so you might think. If the information that the Soviet Union once fired a cannon in space is new to you, then you're probably not alone. The story of the Richter R-23 autocannon test in space was a closely guarded secret for many years, and even now, the entire operation remains shrouded in mystery. This was set during the heady days of the 1970s, with the Cold War reaching its zenith and the two superpowers battling to outdo each other. Whether it was space travel, gigantic holes in the ground, nuclear weapons, or monstrous military hardware, the Cold War threw up countless countless fascinating showdowns. And if you're not sure what I'm talking about when I say drilling massive holes in the ground, definitely check out the video on Mega Projects, this channel, all about the Kola Super Deep Borehole. It's a, it's a giant hole. People really liked it. But the tale of the R-23 test, the only time a weapon has ever been used in space, has fallen through the cracks until now. While popular culture is filled with intergalactic battles, humans themselves have never got close. Let's be honest, if we can't even put a human on Mars, we're not really in a position to go all Star Wars just yet. But that isn't to say that the concept has not been explored. The 1960s saw spy satellites from the Soviet Union and the USA launched into space, and though their purpose was surveillance, and prestige of course, these proved to be the early stages of a short-lived space warfare race. In 1962, during the Starfish Prime test, the US launched a ground-based nuclear weapon into space. The resulting explosion caused the deactivation of both Soviet and American satellites orbiting at the time. The ramshackle nature of the test and the resulting international outcry heralded the Outer Space Treaty of 1967, in which 110 nations agreed not to use nuclear weapons in space. Sounds like a very good idea. In 1984, the United States set up the US Strategic Defense Initiative, often referred to as Star Wars. The intended purpose of the SDI was to protect the United States from intercontinental ballistic missiles launched by the Soviet Union. This defense system would incorporate both Earth and space-based laser battle stations designed to intercept missiles. If the words space-based laser battle stations sound a little bit more George Lucas than Ronald Reagan, you'd be quite right. They also sound awesome. By the late 1980s, the idea was mired in debate over whether such a system was not only needed, but actually possible. The collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, well, that signaled the end of the SDI. But it is getting a new lease of life. Well, maybe. President Trump announced in 2019 the establishment of the Space Force because, and I quote, space is a war-fighting domain just like the land, air, and sea. He certainly has a way with words, doesn't he? <laughs> Again, this was highly controversial, with many arguing whether such a military addition is needed and worthwhile. In fact, the Space Force TV show on Netflix lampoons this whole thing. It's excellent. I've watched the whole thing. It's just, it's really good. A hefty allotted congressional budget of $15.4 billion for 2021 has been set aside for the president's project. However, should Trump lose in November's election, it's difficult to imagine that the Democratic Party is going to continue with this old Space Force plan. On the Russian side, the Russian Space Force was established in 1992, though it has been shuffled backwards and forwards between other departments ever since, even being dissolved and reformed twice. First, and sorry to shatter the illusion so early, but the R-23 was in fact a cannon that was developed for the Soviet Air Force and then later adapted for use in space. When it first arrived on the scene, it was the fastest firing single barrel cannon ever used, capable of pumping out a hefty 2,600 rounds per minute. Its shells had a velocity of 2,414 kilometers an hour and could reach distances up to 3.2 kilometers away. But this was a piece of military hardware that took a bit of time to get right. 
The story really begins in the 1950s, when the Soviets began to notice that they were having issues with their bomber turret cannons. These cannons usually protruded well out from the aircraft and were susceptible to shaking due to the airflow around them while airborne. A design contest was initiated to create a cannon with a significantly shorter length, and eventually it came down to two designs. One from Aaron Abramovich Richter at OKB-16 in Moscow, and another design from Igor Dmitriev's TSKB-14 in Tula, which is south of Moscow. While the first would eventually travel into space, Dmitriev's design would also be developed and went on to become the Afnasev Makarov AM-23 autocannon, which was used widely by the Soviet Air Force. Richter's design, however, was a unique one. Not only was it front-loading, meaning that the shells moved back into the chamber rather than forwards, but the revolver cannon layout meant that its firing rate was significantly higher. This design also considerably shortened the barrel, and with its center of gravity directly beneath it, it retained excellent stability while in the air. As the name suggests, this gas-operated revolver cannon uses multiple chambers just like a revolver handgun. In total, it has four cartridge chambers and uses three separate gas systems. One ejects the spent cartridge from the chamber, another loads a fresh cartridge, and the third powers the revolver cylinder and the feed mechanism, which moves the shells down the line as the gun is being fired. The feed mechanism works from right to left, with an ammunition belt fed into the gun from the right-hand side. The belt continues out from the left, with spent cartridges being ejected forwards. The R-23 is thought to weigh around 58.5 kilograms and has a barrel length of 1.4 meters. The first 261P prototype was produced in 1957, but numerous problems meant that it didn't become operational until August 1964, when it was given its official designation R-23. The autocannon was eventually installed on almost all of the Tupolev Tu-22s, the Soviet Union's first supersonic bomber. If you want a video on that, let me know. When we think about the more powerful, more destructive weapons that the Soviets had at their disposal, it's a little strange that the R-23 remains one of their most secretive weapons for so long that we know of, that is. No doubt this was heavily influenced by its activity in space, which I'm coming to in just a bit, but also as a general weapon used on the Tupolev. It wasn't actually until the Tupolev was exported to Libya, Iraq, and Syria in the 1970s that the outside world began to get its first view. During the Israeli occupation of South Lebanon in 1985, Israeli soldiers discovered a crate filled with 23mm ammunition, which left them a bit baffled. The crate had been mistakenly delivered along with ammunition to be used on the Soviet ZS. Su-23-4 tank. The first time a Western nation came face to face with the R-23 came in 1987, when a French bomb disposal team was called to examine a Libyan Tupolev which had been shot down over Chad. As I mentioned earlier, chances are you have never heard about the first and only space cannon. Even now, 55 years later, the exact events are still incredibly mysterious and very vague, with different sources sometimes contradicting each other. But by piecing things together, we can get a rough idea of what took place on January the 24th, 1975. Between 1971 and 1982, the Soviets launched a series of small space stations into orbit. The Salyut program was undertaken under the guise of space discovery, and while there certainly was a lot of science done, some of them had a bit of an ulterior motive. Of the nine Salyut stations that were successfully launched, it's thought that at least three of them were actually spy satellites operating under the Soviet Almaz program, a secretive military project. And just a little side note here, the Americans did exactly the same thing with their Gemini program, the manned orbiting laboratory a crewed reconnaissance satellite was launched in 1965 as part of the Gemini 2 launch, but due to funding constraints, it was actually just a short-lived program. When the Soviet Salyut 1 launched on April 19, 1971, it became the world's first space station, spending a total of 175 days in space, hosting a crew on board for a record 23 of those days. Salyut 2 launched on the 4th of April 1973 and was every inch a military satellite disguised as a civilian one. But after just two days, it began losing atmospheric pressure as its flight control system failed. Five days later, its solar panels were mysteriously torn away, leaving the satellite completely crippled. But it was Salyut 3 that would carry
carry a very different kind of payload than normal. The R23 that had been installed is thought to have been specially adapted and reduced to 14.5mm caliber down from its original 23mm. The Salyut 3 mission departed on the 25th of June 1974 and was a fairly groundbreaking mission in itself, as it was the first space station to be able to maintain its constant orientation relative to the Earth's surface. This was done with over half a million firings of its altitude control thrusters. This was also a military satellite that carried out numerous tests for onboard reconnaissance sensors, as well as taking pictures which were eventually returned to Earth. But after the failed docking of the Soyuz 15 spacecraft, Salyut 3 was left unmanned, and with the narrowing window of time it had left in space due to orbital decay, the time seemed right for a truly unique test. Firing the R-23 with cosmonauts on board was entirely out of the question, as nobody really had much of an idea how the cannon would react after being fired in space. According to some reports, the entire 20-ton space station needed to be rotated to aim the R-23. What exactly they were aiming at has never been explained. Also, we know very little about the actual firing, except we believe that it took place on the 24th of January 1975, just hours before the Salyut 3 was scheduled to be deorbited, which is when a section carrying film stock and data breaks away and parachutes down to Earth while the remainder burns up on re-entry. To counteract the recall from the R-23, the Salyut 3 fired its boosters at the same time. Some people claim it was fired until depletion, while others state it only let off a few of the rounds. Unfortunately for us, the results of this test remain, to this day, highly classified. Okay, so we've already had our first gunshot in space, but is there more to come? Despite President Trump's bluster with regards to the Space Force, it's difficult to imagine anything of any significance happening any real time soon. When governments around the world take stock of 2020, it would be quite a surprise if they deemed imaginary space battles as a high priority. The fear of war between the Soviet Union and the United States during the 1970s was really very real, especially after the two teetered on the brink of war during the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962. Both countries appeared perfectly content to spend lavishly on extraordinary projects like putting a cannon into space and firing it. But those days have probably passed now, and, well, honestly, thankfully so. What seems more likely is the expanded use of anti-satellite weapons, which are fired from Earth and are capable of destroying objects in space. Only the USA, Russia, China, and India are known to possess this type of weapon, and while there have been tests to destroy their own satellites, they've never actually been used as an act of war. But who knows, maybe one day we'll need to strap cannons to our spacecrafts and head off into space to fight hordes of extraterrestrials intent on enslaving the human race. And if that day does come, well, we'll know who to speak to. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, smash that like button. Don't forget to subscribe. Leave your comments for future Mega Projects videos below. Upvote the ones you like. And I'll see you next time.